So I want to talk more about trees tonight. Uh, uh, I know my fellow sensei Carl has been talking about trees, and I mentioned how the uh, head of the uh, retreat house in Dublin, where Ro Roshi Kennedy and I and Miriam, sensei Miriam uh, had our session in July, uh, also spoke about the trees. In particular, you recall, I, I believe I mentioned them already here once. Uh, we did our kinyan, our walking meditation, uh, in this huge uh, garden, more like a orchard, uh, uh, magnificent old trees, and some from the 18th century, and uh, how he referred to uh, the trees, uh, some of the large ones, as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as senseis. And uh, the uh, six lime trees that were behind the house, 100 foot lime trees, ancient vista, and a line, six of them behind, forming the back part of the property. Uh, they were the Roshis. And the 250 year old uh, walnut tree that I, I did mention once before, uh, that was the sixth patriarch, very famous patriarch, Huineng of China. Uh, but there's deep truth to this, that uh, trees indeed are magnificent beings, very deep, uh, holy, really. Uh, so when Joshu uh, speaks uh, uh, in his famous koan and says in response to a question about what is it all about, what is Buddha, what is uh, it, uh, you may remember that he says, the, the oak tree in the garden. So on a first level, that's about, it's just there, just as we should be there, just present. And it's also about our truly being present to it, and losing the distinction. So anything is it, because we're it, and it, and we're it, and it's it, and we're all one. But when you really get a sense of what it entails, you know that the tree, in fact, has all this, this depth, this power, this majesty. And maybe some of the different levels of, of, of experience and perception which people have had and testified to about communion with it as tree uh, can help us to uh, grasp and appreciate, at least maybe as a catalyst for our ourselves. So, uh, as I say, we can see in some of the classical myths, uh, uh, and some of the uh, mythical traditions of various peoples, uh, the tree spirits, dryads they're called, you know, tree spirits in, in Greek mythology, and even things like leprechauns and fairies, they're attached to, to nature and often with trees. Uh, and this is, these aren't just products of imagination. They're a way of saying, well, there's a spiritual presence here, a spiritual, on a certain level here, an nature spirit. Uh, on a pretty rudimentary level, but I think, uh, at that point, but already uh, a sense of a numinous quality to, to anything, really, certainly. Uh, it's particularly accessible uh, in trees. Uh, and Certainly when I was working with my yoga teacher, uh, Master Choa, uh, he would uh, point out uh, the kind of reverence we should have and the kind of awareness we should have of trees. So if you come to a majestic tree in a park or something, as you're walking or just on the street, it speaks to you, <laughs> indeed. Um, you can pause. I found that it's helpful, first of all, to generally to receive a blessing, place your hand, but first of all in a receptive way, a reverential way to receive the blessing that it offers. And it, I became aware, and as others did, that the trees can be masculine or feminine. You can't know until you actually meet it. <laughs> but uh, either way, you can first receive the blessing and then to the extent that you feel drawn to do so, you can extend the blessing as well. Uh, Another level that I became aware of was when I was in, because uh, we Tibetans, you know, often speak about the different nature spirits and mountains and trees, and Hindus as well. When I was in India, and then I, with Bernie Glaston, Roshi Glaston, in, 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 in 2012, 
2012. Uh, we stopped at one point uh, at uh, the local Maharaja's house and lunch there with him. But on his property, he had a shrine, I mean, a tree that had a shrine built around it. And this was said to be the tutelary deity of the whole area. You know, and I treated it with proper reverence, and there was obviously a presence here associated with the tree, but on a higher level, if you like. Mm -hmm. it branches out, that's my point, it branches out slowly to the whole of reality. This was a whole region, a whole locality, uh, and the presence was there. And, you know, there's nothing evil or demonic about it. This was a very benevolent presence. It was, it was protective, it was benevolent. Uh, and, you know, it could, you, could, you could sense it. Hmm? I remember very strongly as we were on the bus about to leave, I had a strong sense of its presence just as we were about to leave its, <laughs> its locale. In other words, kind of uh, overseeing our, our, our departure. Mm -hmm. But perhaps the most eloquent, the most the richest of testimonies that I found is in this uh, book, which I got some years ago, called The Water and the Spirit. Of course, that evokes Christian imagery, which is very profound elemental as well. Um, but this is about his, uh, the author's shamanic initiation, ritual magic and initiation in the life of an African shaman. And this particular man had a Western education, I think Harvard, something like that. And when he went back to his people, he had this, he had to reconnect with the wisdom of his own place. And uh, the uh, initiation rite involved trees. And they were supposed to, he and the others were supposed to simply be, look at a tree. And so there he was, looking at this tree, and go a whole day <laughs> looking at the tree. And you know, others seemed to be experiencing something that he wasn't. Nothing happened. So, you know, he pretended he's, he had some experience, and of course we could tell he was just you know fake. Uh, so Finally, this is what happened. So, uh, he says, when I looked once more at the Yila, the Yila tree, the particular tree, I became aware that it was not a tree at all. Just like we're not who we think we are either. So much more, as was the tree, which he now experienced. How had, I, how had I ever seen it as such? I do not know how this transformation occurred. Uh, out of nowhere, in the place where the tree had stood, appeared a woman, a masculine feminine. Uh, she, uh, she wore a veil, and I could, intend, I could uh, sense the intensity emanating from her. And that intensity exercised an irresistible magne magnetic pull. I could tell that behind the veil was an extremely beautiful and powerful entity. The pool was like drinking water after a day of wandering in the desert. My body felt like it was floating. When I looked again, she lifted her veil. She was green, light green. Even her eyes were green. But the greenness in her had nothing to do with the color of her skin. She was green from the inside out, as if her body were filled with green. I do not know how I knew this, but this green was the expression of immeasurable love. I'm very much reminded, by the way, of some of you know about the Tibetan and Tibetan Buddhism, about green Tara, very powerful Bodhisattva, feminine uh, Tara, was green. I'm very much reminded of that here. Never before had I felt so much love. I felt as if I had missed her all my life. I could not tell the nature of our love. It was not romantic, it wasn't filial. It was a love that expressed, that surpassed all, any known classification, <laughs> which is the point, <laughs> going beyond all classifications. Like two loved ones who had been apart for a long time, we dashed toward each other and flung ourselves into each other's arms. The sensation of embracing, embracing her body blew my body into countless pieces which became millions of conscious cells 
or longing to reunite with the whole that was her. That's what we're talking about. When you're sitting on your cushion, that's the kind of experience you can have. The sensation of racing her body blew my body into countless pieces, which became millions of conscious cells, all longing to reunite with the whole that was her. In the course of this experience, I felt as if I were moving backward in time and forward in space. So in all space and time, it reunites here. That's the experience as well. So beyond time and beyond space. It includes everything. And so remember I said, it's branch, literally <laughs> branching, branching out. Mm -hmm. Then the green lady spoke to me. That's another thing. Uh, I cried abundantly the whole time. Human beings are often unable to receive because we don't know what to ask for. We do not know how to pray as we ought, as St. Paul said. It was happiness that I felt. If this was happiness that I felt, then no human could sustain this amount of well-being for even a day. So we have to get, build ourselves up to it. Hmm? The part in us that yearns for these kinds of feelings and experiences is not human. We're so much more than that. Hmm? If humans were to feel this way all the time, they would probably not be able to do anything other than shed tears of happiness for the rest of their lives. Which, in any case, would be very short. <laughs> exactly. Hmm? Exactly. I cannot repeat the speech of the green lady. It would be disclosed to be dishonoring, to diminish it. The power of nature exists in its silence. Ours too. God's too. Human words cannot encode meaning this way. The speech of the Green Lady was intended to stay alive in silence. So let it be. So, that's a lot there. You know, and, and in the end, of course, as I'm saying, we're the tree. We're, it, it's, it's beyond human as we are. Uh, and of course, you know, many spiritual traditions compare the human being to a tree. Our trunk and our limbs you know, form a tree. Uh, and in the Kabbalistic tradition, you know, we are the, 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 the tree of life. You know, there's a diagram here with Adam and Eve in the garden and the, the tree of life above the tree of good and evil, uh, which is our spine. That's the tree with the, with the kundalini serpent on it. Yeah. That's the serpent in the garden is really the human being. So that's all there. Uh, the tree of life in the, uh, in the in the Kabbalistic tradition is rooted in heaven, with the branches coming down. Interesting. So as, if, as if the kundalini energy comes from above, integrates the whole thing, goes up again, like a sap in a tree. The Holy Spirit, if you want to call it that. Uh, so is it, is it coming down, or are we rooted above, or rooted below, or both, like Christ from above, or Christology from above, or Christology from below, as they say? And I think it's better to see it's just not a, a matter of intensity, as we heard just a minute ago, and interiority. The deeper you go, deeper, higher, um, space and time, beyond, uh, it, you, you reach these dimensions that just brand, that branches out, and that includes more and more. Uh, uh, and the other only element I want to point out here, which is important, is in the Zen and Christian tradition, uh, is that in a sense the tree has to die in order to live. Passion, resurrection. Uh, all that sap and all that energy has to go deeper and deeper and be transformed to be connected to the whole. That's why we have, you know, the uh, the dragon roars from the dead tree. It's famous. This wonderful verse. That's Roshi Kennedy's uh, calligraphy in, in Annie Yee's. Uh, you've probably seen this one. I think I've shown this before. I have it on my wall at home, a bigger version of this. Uh, so the dragon roars, the dragon being the enlightened one, roars when the, from the dead tree. So it's when our passions have been transformed, when they've died and risen, when all those energies have been uh, sublimated or integrated, rather. Right? 
um, then that's when the dragon roars. Uh, a, a similar call is the 27th one in the Blue Cliff Record, which says, the question is, what happens when the tree dies and the leaves fall? And it says, you embody the golden breeze. The spirit. Mm -hmm. I call it that, the absolute breath of life. And sap. And I'll just close with, uh, well, remember this is what Jesus said. I am the vine, you are the branch. There's just one tree, one cosmic tree, and it's Jesus. One vine, and one tree. The kingdom of God is like a, a mustard seed which became a great tree. Yeah, it's a whole thing. Um, and it's, we're just, with the branches, with the branches, we're part of that. We're much more than we think, and we're not the center, we're, well, everything is the center. And the center is everywhere, and the circumference is nowhere, as the, the Christian mystics have said. Mm -hmm. So, next time you meet a tree, you better kiss the ground, it's holy ground. And if you really meet the tree, you'll realize